Hi, everybody. How you doing? I'm Matt. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to give everybody just a couple more seconds to settle in. Uh, I'll do some housekeeping while we're doing there. So uh, this is on a 30 second delay. When I say something, I have to wait 30 seconds for you guys to respond. And I'm just reminding myself and you of that. So uh, if I said something and I don't respond immediately, it's because there's a little bit of a delay. Uh, second is please use the chat if you want to talk with each other or talk with me. If you have a question, there's a Q&A portion. Uh, if you have a chat that ends up being a question, we can convert that to Q&A, but no problem. Ask questions anytime. Today, I've got a really great presentation lined up for you. So I'm going to run through that presentation uh, from start to finish. Uh, and I will answer questions, but they're going to be at the end because I have a, a progression and I have a, a lot of ground to cover here. Uh, and I'd really love to give you guys all of the information that I have, and then we'll get to your questions. So perhaps I'll cover those things by the end. Uh, but I've had a lot of fun putting this together. This is a, a topic that I keep revising and evolving as we go along. So this is the latest version of it. Um, I need to look to see if Martin is here. And Martin is probably in here. I saw him. Yes. And I'm going to make sure that Martin is an admin so he can answer your questions and stuff too. So Martin from NovaFlex Germany is here. Uh, chances are if you have a question about product, he will be answering it in the chat. Without further ado, let's get right to it. Um, and while I am starting this, why don't you guys do what some other people have done and uh, let us know where you're tuning in from. We'd love to know. So here we go. Let's start it up. We are here to learn how to photograph a meteor shower, but specifically for a post-processing technique called a radiant composite. That means you're going to be picking lots and lots of pictures, and only through post-processing will you be able to create this image. Uh, it's because you're combining a lot of different elements that happened in the same frame, but not at the same time. So it is a composite. And literally, it's a piece of fiction. Uh, but it has a purpose. The, the radiant is to show you where did all these meteors come from? Because when there's a meteor shower, they come from a location in the sky. And this photograph that we have here, we're going to talk about it in detail later, is from the Perseids meteor shower, which is from the Perseus constellation, which is in the northern sky. And that occurs during the middle of August. It moves around during the night which means if you take a lot of pictures, Perseus is moving around in the sky and you need to realign all those images. That's the short version of explaining what a composite is. But I'm going to go into the long version and that's why you're all here. So our goal is the holy grail of meteor showers. And I might want to point out, and you might have seen it when we're promoting this, there's a big one coming up and a good one coming up in December, uh, the Geminids. That one's going to be very early in the morning. And we'll talk about the details, uh, but there's going to be, it's going to be a good one. There's going to be a lot of meteors and there's going to be a fair amount of darkness. So our purpose here is to prepare you to learn how to photograph that, all of the images you need to create the composite for, for the radiance. Okay, so let's let's kick it off by just looking at some examples that I can show you of what some radiant composites are. One of the earliest composites, radiant composites that I shot was Great Sand Dunes. Uh, we'll go over a lot of these details again. But basically, I shot this one from twilight until moonrise. Um, and this is with a 15 millimeter lens. Only 17 images out of 325 had meteors in them. But it was a good year. So I'm just setting expectations here. You don't never know how many meteors are going to be in your frame. So you got to plan for the best. Uh, so there are a couple of different exposures, and we're going to talk about why. Uh, here's another one. This is from this year's Perseids meteor shower in the Badlands. This is the night of the peak. This was a long night. Uh, and perhaps some of the people here in the audience here were with me on that workshop. Um, but this one I shot with the Z6. It was a 15 millimeter vertical again. Um, and a, a 40 of those images had meteors in them. And it shows there's a lot of meteors in frame here, right? And there was a separate foreground exposure, which was shot while there was still some light in the sky. And then there's a star point shot. And then there's all the meteor shots. And again, we're going to get into that. I'm just showing you some examples now. Here's the day after that. 
and there were a lot fewer meteors, plus the clouds came in. So only nine of my images had meteors. So it doesn't really look like a radiant, but it is. Uh, and I further complicated it by doing a foreground focus stack, which we'll talk about a little bit more later and a separate sky image. And this one is one of my favorite meteor composites ever. This was a surprise. This was two days after the predicted peak of the Perseus meteor shower. There was what's called an outburst, meaning there was a lot more meteors than predicted happening at that time. Uh, and it was documented. Uh, and we just got lucky, but we're going to talk about what being lucky and being prepared mean. But this one had 63 out of 464 images with meteors, and it had a lot of things going for it. But as I'll show you later, I didn't have a dusk image to go with it. So we had to solve that separately. But let's talk about now that we've seen those and you can see just what we're working towards. That's a finished product. Let's talk about how to get there baby steps, right? So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to plan. And after we've made a plan, we're going to go scout in person. And then when it comes time to actually be there on the day, I'm going to teach you how to set up and then how to shoot it. So the four steps are kind of easy, you know, but we're going to get into the details. So regarding planning, the first thing you really need to know, and the most important thing you need to know is where is that meteor shower going to be in the sky? How close to the horizon is it going to be? Or how close to Polaris or uh, up at the, the top of the sky? Is it going to be, do you have to look straight up to see it? Um, that's going to be an important thing to know. And there's tools to help you do that. How far will it travel during the night? Because you want to keep that in your frame so that you can align all of those meteors later to create the radiant as if they were all coming from a single point. How active is the meteor shower? How many meteors are going to happen per hour predicted, right? And there's other really important things like, is a moon going to be out? Because if the moon is going to be out, you're going to see little to none meteors. Uh, so you want to find a period of time when there's no moon to shoot. And that's, that is the peak time when there's no light in the sky. So the meteors can be bright, but many of them can be dim. So you want to capture as many as possible by having no light in the sky. How bright is it going to be there? And that could be the conditions, like how much light pollution do you have there? Um, and other things could affect that. And how many hours of darkness do you have? And all of these things can be found inside of apps. My primary app for planning is PhotoPills. PhotoPills gives me the most information about how to plan for a shoot. And we're going to give you a lot of examples on how to use it to plan smartly, specifically for a meteor shower. And that's on both iOS and Android, and it's very affordable. It's worth every penny and more. Um, they should charge more, but uh, they don't. And thanks to Raphael and the guys for not charging more because, gosh, it's, it is, it is one of the indispensable tools in my pocket. The other one that I use is Stellarium. Stellarium is more geared towards understanding what's in the sky, celestial objects. And I'll give you a demo of why I also have that in my pocket. Uh, and you can also use that on the desktop too, which is great if you're planning from your laptop uh, for or from your touch device. So in photo pills, there's a pill, each of their modules they call pills. Um, there's a pill called Meteor Showers. And this is a screenshot I took back from August. And on this screen, it shows you a lot of information. We're going to go into more detail. But you can see that it looks like on this screen that the Perseids is a really good meteor shower. And the other ones are less good. And there's two really strong indicators. Um, let's see if I can draw on this. I'd really like to draw on this. There we go. I'm going to turn on drawing. And I'm going to change the color here so we so something we can see. So you can see that over here, it has uh, an energy icon, and it also has an energy bar. Oops, that one is uh, not drawing so good. There we go. So that energy bar goes upwards as the, your, the, the, the quality of the meteor shower goes up. And you'll notice that in all of the other ones here, not so good, right? So, 
uh, that's something that you would want to pay attention to when you're looking through this pill. This is on an iPad so that the information is larger. They just shuffle the information around a little bit. All of the same information is here. From the Perseids peak this year, here's a lot of information that we had. You'll see that it's telling you a bunch of things, right? It's, it's telling you what time you're looking at right there what the peak is, it's 8.12 at 3.58 a.m., and it's going to be 87.7 meteors per hour. It's also telling you that there's going to be no moon in the sky right then, and that's really important stuff. And if you're curious, you could also look over here, you know, to see if the moon, it goes up at 10.17 a.m. and down at 10.22 p.m. That's really important. Another important feature for the Perseids specifically is whether the galactic core is going to be in view. And you can see it goes up at 9.52 and it goes down at 108. It happens to the, the galactic core is the opposite end of where the Perseids are, them being in the northern sky. But you want to know, like, if this is going to be around, what's the other end of the tail going to look like? So uh, since it lives in part of the per Perseus is in the Milky Way at that time, it's good to know that. You also see those same uh, energy indicators over here, and you're going to see some other interesting things here, like the moon's azimuth and elevation, how many meters per hour is over here for the Perseids, and its azimuth and elevation. The elevation being really important, like 61 degrees above the horizon. Uh, so you know it's going to get up pretty high. Above 45 degrees, yeah. So you're going to need to have a wide-angle lens. That's what that tells you right there. So now that we've seen all these things, uh, let's compare the, the peak day and the day after the peak and the third day. And these are the three images that I showed you, the results, right? This in here shows you the probability of having lots of meteors. And keep watching that as we go through. You're going to see that there's going to be fewer meteors there and fewer meteors there. Um, and as you go through these, you're also going to see where's the moon at and where is it going to be in the sky. So the moon being down here and this being how high in the sky your meteor shower is. So as you scroll across left and right, we'll show you a video of how this works. It's going to show you how high the Perseids climb in the sky versus how low below the horizon, which is this line, uh, the moon will dip. And that tells you a lot about how dark it's going to be. So this is really incredible that they fit this much information into one graphical user interface. So looking at this, we knew more than a year ahead of time that this was going to be an incredible time to shoot the Perseids at the Badlands because of the quantity of meteors per hour and how little moon there was going to be. There's going to be like six hours of darkness, which was incredible. So uh, we knew that there was a high probability given all of the opportunities that we had that we're going to do good. And we plan to shoot it the day after, and if possible, the day after too. And there was a surprise on that day, which we'll get into more. But this data sheet allows you from any place to say, I want to know what the probability is of knowing how much darkness I have, how many meters per hour, and how much effort I should put into being there. So those are the things. There's another opportunity that you have called the night AR or augmented reality. This is during the, the two days after. I took these screenshots while we were there. You're going to see that the Perseids was really high in the sky at that time. And that was 310 in the morning. <laughs> so the Perseids were way, way, way up high in the sky. And that's okay, right? But there were also one, two three other meteor showers happening at the same time. And as you scoot around looking through your camera's lens and pointing it in many directions, you can then see how many things are happening in the sky and what direction they're happening in. It really helps you orient your composition in this way. So the night AR or augmented reality is going to help you plan a lot. So let's go take a look at some video to show you what this looks like. I'm going to show you uh, a screen cap of what I did planning for the Geminids while I was out in Yosemite. And this is from uh, PhotoPills. So or actually, 
let's see. No, this is here in my studio. I sh I recorded this very recently. So here is photo pills on the iPad, and I went into the meteor shower pill. And if you scroll down on the left-hand side, you'll see the geminids are there, and you tap on it. And over on the right-hand side, you're going to be able to scroll back and forth to show you the blue line being the moon and the black line being the geminids how high in the sky are the geminids and how low in the sky is the moon and then it just tips under and you'll see the meteors per hour goes way up to 150 meteors per hour and you have about a two two and a half hour window there and it starts at 2 48 p.m and i'm just going to pause it right here so at 2 48 p.m is the beginning of the best time to shoot the geminids in my location and that's what i'm set for here because there's a waxing gibbous moon an 80 percent brightness moon we need to wait for the moon to go down and that's what photopills is telling us here <clears throat> and it's also very high in the sky so that tells me two very important things when to show up and where to point my camera so i need to know i need to have a pretty wide lens so i might choose an 11 millimeter for this you know uh, or i might stick with my 15 millimeter nonetheless I have a lot of important information from this just watching to see like where are where am i going to point it and how many meters per hour and when to show up so uh when you turn on the augmented reality and this is down in my studio i'm now looking for where the geminids are in the sky and i'm just spinning around up oh, there's a meteor shower but it's not the one that i want where is it gosh it told me that it's really high in the sky so i'm going to start tilting backwards and looking higher and I'm going to keep changing the time. And there's another meter shower that's not it. And another one that's not it. And boom, there it is. There's the Geminids. Almost straight up. You see that? And you can see where. So at 6 a.m. it's going to be over there. And at 2 a.m. it's going to be over there. So now I know where to set up my camera to keep the Geminids in the frame the whole time. If I want to process a radiance. You don't have to. You don't have to. And I'm just going to go back to me. You don't have to absolutely have the radiant in your frame, but it makes it a lot easier to process it later. Uh, and we're not going to get into the processing. I'll give you the tools to understand the processing uh, by giving you a nice link to that. But it's important to know um, that it makes it easier by keeping that in the frame. So that'll that'll help you make decisions on, gosh, where to frame up. Let's head back in. Uh, so we have some other videos I can show you. So I mentioned Stellarium, right? So this is uh, from the Perseids. This is what you can find for Stellarium. When you open up Stellarium, you search for the thing that you want to find in the sky. And this was the Perseids, right? And now it's going to t ask you when you want to do it. And this is the peak, right? And now it's showing me it starts near the horizon and it tilts up towards Polaris up towards the center of the sky, right? And then that's the end of night when it starts getting like that. And I'm just gonna play it one more time so you can see it. So I just go in there and I'm already on the date, right? So I click in the Perseids. I was there at the time and I recorded this. And then I'm gonna change the time and I'm just gonna go forward and say, oh, now I can understand a different way of looking at where it's gonna travel through the sky. And that goes up towards the, the azimuth the top of the sky there so that one helps a lot it's a very helpful way to look at it and let's take a look at the geminids i'll hit play on this one so first thing i need to do is change the date and i'm just recording here i'm changing the date to the peak of the geminids which i know is december 14th and it's going to be at 2 a.m so i'll just jump ahead a little bit here and we get down to the time in the morning that it's going to be and then you go search for the geminids and you have to type it right and you tap on that and it's going to show where it is in the sky and now you can see some info about it but also the visibility tab there will tell you uh where it's going to go and how high it is in the sky and then how high it comes back down how dark it's going to be and that graph there where it's darkest means the moon is down so this is also giving you a visual indication of how bright the sky is going to be versus not. So uh, I would definitely recommend having both of those in your pocket. And that would be wonderful. 
So this is something that I did. You don't need to be on scene to understand how you might compose. It's This was me in my hotel room in the Badlands figuring out how high the Perseids would be in the sky, and I just took these screenshots. So you can plan and understand basically what focal length you might want to use by using the augmented reality. Let's move on to scouting. In fact, you know what? I'm just going to take a quick peek at the q and I know I said I was going to do this. Uh-huh. Answered. Good. So, all right. I'm going to come back to those. All right. So moving back to this. So once you're done planning, which can be done from anywhere, scouting is in person. To maximize your chances of success, we're going to talk about scouting in person. Number one is safety. You got to know the terrain that you're going to be photographing on. So uh, you need to walk around with daylight and you need to understand whether you need to be wearing hiking boots or trail shoes or even sneakers, right? This is really important. Know whether you feel safe in that location. Is this is an area with a lot of uh, wildlife, perhaps apex predators, you know, or insects that you don't want to deal with. You need to know these things and you can only experience that firsthand. So please, please scout during the daytime. Um, some people, it's really important to know where the nearest restroom is. I'd say that's 100% of humans, right? Um, and to understand how far you're going to walk to and from your car. And also to choose your composition. In daylight, it's going to be pretty easy. You can walk around the night AR mode of photo pills and point it in just the direction that you want and choose your foreground versus sky. Um, and maybe you're camping because it's not near any services, but that location is just the right thing. So you need to know. So that's an essential part of scouting and this will definitely increase your success. Um, I was just in Yosemite and I was considering coming back to Yosemite for the Geminids, but then I saw that because down in the valley, uh, the mountains are so tall, I would never see it when it's near the horizon. But it is way above the mountain peaks when it's at its brightest, which is between 2.30 and 4.30 a.m. So it is quite possible. And uh, I'll just draw for you here. So so in this case, you know, this is 4.30 a.m. That's the end of it. And then up here is where it's going to go. So it's coming down from here to get to there. And this is 12.10 a.m. over here. So we can we can imagine that it would take a really wide lens in that specific spot, which I probably wouldn't choose because there's a lot of headlights there. But I can know that this might be a good place to come back to on scene. And that's part of on scene scouting is pulling out photo pills again. Um, now we're going to talk about setting up. Wow. So this is where I need to urge you to, to consider this. And I'm going to go away from the slide for a second. Please expect to just be patient. Don't rush. Don't be distracted. If you're the kind of person that is distracted and says, I need to be doing something else, definitely bring a second camera that you can go and set up elsewhere and take a lot of different pictures in other places because your primary camera is going to be faced in one direction from the lightest point that you want to start shooting until the end of the meteor shower. It's not going to move a millimeter. And I think it's really important to point that out and to coach you just to be patient, to resist the urge to adjust anything whatsoever, because it makes the edit that much easier. So you're going to choose your composition very carefully and when there is light out, if possible. Um, and then you just commit to it. Just don't move. Just don't move. You don't fidget. Don't say, oh, I should be 10 degrees tall, or like higher. Just commit to that and bring a lot of water and snacks a comfy chair i brought my my little walk stool here for for this shoot and make sure you have the proper attire whether it be for warm weather or cool weather geminids are coming up you probably want to be warm or you know walk back to your car and, and get out of the cold wind there and again i'm going to repeat do not move your tripod because it's going to it might ruin your chances of being able to make the composite so I'll just keep saying it again. Um, this is an example of our first night from Badlands where everybody was set up facing north along a very typical grand location of the Badlands. Um, and there were a couple of people that 
move their tripods, you know, and they, they had less of a chance uh, to, to make the composite they wanted. Um, and some people brought second tripods and they got two shots at it, right? So let's talk about gear. It's relatively simple what you need. You need a camera or two, right? If you want to double your chances, bring a second camera. If you're, if you need to be doing something else for those two to four hours, then bring a second camera and go shoot elsewhere, you know, close by, whatever, and bring the same number of tripods as you have cameras and heads, right? Uh, full batteries are really important here. In this case, um, the full batteries are just, for me, I was astounded. Uh, my Nikon Z6 and Z6 II were champions. I got four hours of shooting off of one full battery doing the entire sequence. And I was, I was delighted. I knew that it was great at using power. You should know how long your camera can run. And you might want to test that ahead of time by setting up a sequence that simulates what you might be doing and letting it run with a timer and figuring out when it stops. Um, it's not as critical as star trails where an interruption might ruin the picture because you have to start it. You wouldn't be able to connect the, the star trails. If a battery runs out, no problem. Just pop the battery out and put a new one in because all you're looking for are frames that contain meteors. And that's it. If you miss a meteor, no big deal, right? It's not going to kill the, the radiant. There are some cameras that allow it to be charged via power bank. My Z6 II of those will allow that. So I just plug in the USB-C and put a little power bank on the side, Jupio, whatever. And that will make the camera run even longer than the four hours that it already does with the native battery. You do need an intervalometer. There are some cameras that have reliable intervalometers built into them. I don't find the software easy to use. All intervalometers are basically built the same way and are used the same way and therefore are programmed the same way. So an external intervalometer, just plug it in and program it to set an infinite number of images. Once you get into your meteor shower stage, that's good. A wide fast lens, you know, I put 14 to 16 millimeters here. Why? Because you want to have as much sky as possible because the meteors are going to be coming from a point in your frame and zooming out. The closer they are to the radiant, the shorter they are. The further away from the radiant they are, the longer they are. Uh, so some people might choose to cheat their frame to have the radiant on an edge so that they get longer meteors on the other side. That's totally fine. I tend to put it somewhere near the middle because I like my radiance to be somewhere on the thirds inside my frame. Uh, you can shoot an 11 millimeter too, but the wider you go, the smaller the meteors are going to be. So, and when I say fast, I mean 2.8 or faster lens. You're generally going to be shooting at 2.8. Uh, if you shoot more wide open, you might see dimmer meteors, but you might have terrible coma on those meteors and they might not look right. And I put an asterisk by this, the star tracking mount. And we'll come back to it. I think that that's an option. Um, and yeah, we'll talk more about that. So your camera settings, right? You're going to make, you're going to actually make three different photographs during this sequence. The first photograph that you're going to make is for the landscape. You need something that establishes within this astro landscape image that the sky belongs to a particular location. You need to say, um, I'm at the Badlands, or I'm at Yosemite, or I'm in my backyard, right? Uh, you need to say, this was here. If you don't do that, it's just an astro photography image, and that's okay. But that's not the kind of photography that I make or what I'm teaching right now. So your first photograph, you're going to lower the ISO. It might not be all the way down to 100, but it might be like 800 or 1250, and you're going to stop down for more depth of field and get as much of your landscape in focus as possible at a higher quality because you have more light available. It's possible to do that, right? And all your tripod is locked down at this point, right? Your head is not moving. Your legs are not moving. It might be buried with metal spikes, right? So you're taking that first image during dusk and you're going to say, all right, this is going to be my base image. And I'm going to blend that with the things that come after this. After you successfully capture one to three or five dusk images for variety, uh, then you're going to make star point images for the purposes of a star point stack edit. And that's your second thing. And that's, I think I've taught this before here. 
uh, you're going to take 10 to 21 images. And why do I say 10 to 21? Because it really depends on where you're processing it. Um, for Mac, Starry Landscape Stacker says 10 to 20 images. I've heard that prime numbers are best, prime quantities of images are best for Sequator. Uh, so, and they suggested 21. I just tell everybody to take 21 images, uh, but I, to be factual, I said 10 to 21 here. And you're going to take those images and you're going to put them into the software afterwards. And it's going to stack up all those stars and make them brighter and cleaner and get all the noise in between the stars and reduce it. So if you shot at 6,400, it might look like it's shot at 800. It's magic. And that's a separate thing to teach, but we're shooting three different images here. So the first one was the landscape. The second one was a background for these meteors. That's the star point stack. And that's a high quality background that might show the Milky Way and a star field. And then the third thing you're going to shoot is hundreds of images. And you might get some meteors in that. So at that point, I just suggest that everybody set their camera to 30 seconds because there's not much star blur during those images. Uh, however, it's not so blurry that you might mistake, you might not be able to spot a meteor amongst all of the stars. So if you take a bunch of 30 second images, ad infinitum until it gets too bright for the meteors to show up, you're in a good place. And all you have to do is go hunting for those meteors afterwards and ignore all of the other images. And the only part of that image that matters is the meteor. You're going to discard the rest of it, or rather mask it out. So those are the three things you're going to photograph during this sequence. And when I say NPF, I might have talked about this before. I don't know if you've joined me for those. That is a shutter speed setting. That is the maximum allow a shutter, allowable shutter duration that you can shoot to have sharp stars. So that's more important for the star point stack images and less important to not important at all for your sequence for capturing meteors. So those are your three missions while you're out there shooting is to do that. Here's an example of a landscape image. So this one was from the peak night of the Perseids this year. It was 240 seconds, ISO 1250 and F5.6. I didn't have anything truly close to me in the foreground, except for this. And I ended up making it less important. It was brighter than I wanted it to be, but I masked that area and reduced its brightness in Photoshop because I didn't want it to distract, to distract from the rest of the image. But I did want it to be part of the establishment of saying that these are the Badlands. And that's the job of this image. Everything from the horizon up, is not going to be used. You're only going to use this part during your uh, your image stack. So some good advice for this is to just to take a longer exposure, stopping down. You can use hyperfocus if you have things that are close to you. Turn on long exposure noise reduction. Therefore, you get the highest quality image for the ISO that you have. If you're at ISO 100, you may need to do that depending on how long it is. I've done eight minute long shots where I turn on Lenner and then I have to wait 16 minutes to take my next picture, but it doesn't matter because twilight is generally an hour and a half long. So a tip here is that the light does go away quickly during dusk, faster than you'd expect. So you should make some exposures pretty quickly and then you're gonna find out that it got much darker when that's done. Other tips are you can also wait for sunrise or moonrise if you miss dusk, right? But you should compose when it's light out. If you don't, you might miss something important, like something goofy in the foreground. Otherwise, if you get there and it is dark because, let's say, the Geminids start at 2.30 in the morning, you might just use a flashlight to compose or an LED panel to compose your scene and then shut that off and then start your sequence. Um, you can also wait for the moon to rise, and we'll talk about that too. Um, and low landscape, low level landscape lighting, that's what LLL is. You can use that to light up your scene also, and I have a great example of that. So this is the landscape image, it's high quality. This is your sky or your meteors image, right? This one happens to be the star point stack. And you can see just how little information there is down here in the landscape. That's why I took this image so that I could say this is the Badlands and I ignore everything down here and I'm only using everything up here 
because that's the, the 21 images I shot for the Starpoint stack, and I ran them through Star Landscape Stacker. And if we zoomed in, we could see a galaxy right there. It's so sharp. It's beautiful. It's a great bed for having all this. So this was shot at 6,400, uh, and it was shot at 15 seconds long, 21 images at f2.8. So that information allowed me to create a really high quality background image to put place the meteors over. Once I was done establishing that I, I tried the two different ways of doing this, I did NPF default and NPF accurate just to compare them. And I ended up using the default because it was sharp enough. The accurate was a little bit sharper, but not enough to matter. So I brightened this one up a little bit and it was my favorite. Now, talking about the meteors images, after you get that done, all you need to do then is change the 30 second exposures, set your intervalometer to the infinity setting and let it rip. And then you sit back. All of your work is basically done until the, the, the conditions change so that there's too much light in the sky or the clouds roll in and you'll no longer be capturing meteors. And then that's it. You're done recording all of this stuff, right? But some might ask, and I already asked it myself, should you use a star tracker? Well, perhaps you should consider it. Um, the way that I'm promoting that you do it here is with a static tripod, which requires a lot of post-processing. As, and I'll, I'm gonna switch over to my camera here. As your point of origin moves up through the sky, each picture that you take that is away from the image that you choose as the base, let's say that star, starry landscape stacker image that I had at the beginning, I have to rotate back every image to overlay on top of where that was uh, by rotating it. So I need to place a, a point up near Polaris and rotate it so that those stars pop over top of the other one. And... And when you do that, you'll find that the process is laborious. You, there are ways to make it less laborious by creating actions in Photoshop, um, but still aligning every single layer so that the meteors are pointing towards its origin at that time of night, which was not the time it was shot. You have to re rotate it back to that. Um, the star tracker will eliminate needing to do that because what the star tracker does is is it tracks along with the polar rotation in fact it tracks counter to that so your camera would then be following perseus in this case through the sky and you would overlay all of those images and have a lot less rotation to do during post-processing you'd still need to do everything else out which is masking out everything but the meteors so i say consider it but with this caveat if you are not familiar with star trackers, do not do it. If you're not, if you don't already own one and feel very comfortable aligning it and setting it up and knowing that it's not going to slip during that usage, don't do it. Just do it the, the traditional way, which is to set it up a static camera and take a bunch of images. Um, and again, your tripod or head combination has to be super reliable. In this case, I had the Triopod Pro 75. I knew it wasn't going anywhere. In fact, when I do a Star Tracker image, I always move the legs out wider than the first click. So it has a really wide base so that absolutely nothing moves. Uh, but I'm not, uh, I'm not against Star Trackers. I think they're awesome. Um, and personally, I have not used one for this purpose yet. I've tested it. I just don't have a, a processed image to show you from that but I understand when and how they'd be uh, beneficial. All right, so speaking of support, yes, this is a NovaFlex webinar, and yes, I truly believe in NovaFlex or else I wouldn't be here. Um, so I use both the Pro 75 and the Triopod M. Uh, I love those tripods dearly and they go with me everywhere. Um, I would say having two setups allows you to be safe. You know, if one of them slips a little bit, not a big deal. You can fix it, but you know, like it's, it's just really important to, to have variety. And if you have the means to have two trapids and two cameras, please do it. Uh, and y'all know, I love Nova flex. So, uh, let's go back and look at some of these fun things here. Um, I'm just going to put a little bit of do not disturb on that. Great. So one of my first successful meteor shower radiance was great sand dunes in 2017. 
Photo pills did not have the meteor showers pill at that time. So did the best I could with the information I had. And it worked out great. Um, we hiked up the dunes, which are 800 feet tall at 8,000 feet. And it was a trek. So you get up above the dunes enough to see the Sangre de Cristo Mountains behind it. And Perseus was near the horizon because the mountains were so tall. It was very close to the horizon. And that's why that meteor shower radiant looks like it's coming from right in here, right? So everything here is pointing in this way. And they're all pointing towards a certain place in the sky. And this is the classic meteor shower radiant, right? So all of those meteors are pointing in towards Perseus. And that's specifically the composition that I wanted and that we took people up there to do. Uh, so this one was, or it, we shot from pure darkness until moonrise. And moonrise came from the east since we're facing north. And I used that as my final image with a longer exposure to describe the foreground. If I had not done that, all of this would be black in there and you wouldn't know where I was. The rest of these images, there's only 17 images that had meteors out of 325 images. And that is just a lesson. You know, you have no guarantee, even if it's predicted to be a wild meteor shower, there's no guarantee you're going to get a lot of meteors in a frame because they happen all over the sky. Uh, but I like for a radiant image to point towards the origin. So, yep. So this one, uh, my single foreground image was 382 seconds at ISO 200. That was the moon kissed sand dunes. And it also caught the tip of the mountains over here. And I liked that. Um, and this one was really successful. It made me want to do more. So moving back to this year's peak of the Badlands uh, Perseids, we talked about choosing that classic foreground. This is definitely the Badlands over here, right? In Indeniable, right? Uh, there was light pollution from the entry gate not too nearby. And this is the Minuteman Missile Silo Museum that is many miles north of there. So those things are all natural, right? And then in here, we have all of this color. This is sky glow. This is a natural phenomenon, right? And then we have the Milky Way up here, and we have Perseus basically right in here. So we have all of those things happening, and we had a ton of meteors, and it worked out really well as a final composition. So we shot from, uh, this, is, this is a little bit wrong. You know, we started at uh, probably 8.30, and the clouds rolled in at some point during the night around 3 a.m. or 4 a.m., right? So I used the Laowa 15 millimeter and vertical, and that worked out really well. There were only 40 images out of 536 that had meteors, but some of them had multiple meteors in them. So I, we really planned well and executed well on this one. Foreground exposure of 240 seconds, right? Uh, and we talked about that in ISO 1250, so this was nice and high. And then we had our sky stack. We already talked about that one in depth. So let's move on to the next one. The day after the peak. This is really funny. You'd expect there to be maybe as many, but there wasn't. Um, what I wanted to do was challenge myself. So I did a foreground focus stack. There's about 22 images focus stacked here. So I could get that cactus all the way to infinity in focus. And that was a personal challenge to me. It's saying, let's do this and make it happen, right? We got early clouds um, facing in this direction. There was a low meteor count. So you don't see a lot of meteors in this image uh, from basically 8.49 to 1.21 a.m. Uh, there was only nine images that had meteors out of 405. It was really kind of underwhelming. And I was glad that I had a second camera because around to the south behind us, there was a really fantastic galactic core. So having that to shoot in the other direction or other places, having a second setup really worked out that night. Um, so the meteor images were 30 seconds, F2.8, 6400. Pretty easy, classic, right? Um, and then the foreground focus stack was 16 images at 10 seconds and ISO 400. And this was lit. You could tell it was lit. I had uh, uh, Luxley Fiddle using low-level landscape lighting off to the side. And it definitely spilled over here on purpose, too, so that I could give structure to the foreground that was similar in color and shadow depth. 
And then the sky, we did the 20 images and starry landscape stacker stacked them for 15 seconds. So those are the three elements that came together for this composite. Um, and then there is the image, the moment where everybody said, I can't believe this is happening. This is two days after the peak of the Perseids this year. We had what was called an outburst. And I learned this from one of our students. I was not aware of the phrase before this. Uh, that just means that they predict a certain amount of meteors and a certain percentage above that happened. So it was it was something that nobody could have predicted happening, but we happened to be there during a time when there was a massive amount of meteors. Uh, and I think we saw upwards of 120, 140 meteors per hour. And I was seeing like 10 meteors a minute sometimes. And it was just a whole bunch of people laying down and saying, I can't believe this. Is this happening? So we had really clear skies. We already had two setups that night. Um, and then we just started noticing that there was a ton of meteors happening. And this is where I want to just point out that having all of this knowledge of saying, like, I know how to set up. I know which direction to to point in i know basically where it's going to be will help you in a situation where it's already dark it's pitch black where do i point my camera how do i make sure that i can light up the landscape how do i know that i'm going to have the meat the radiant and frame all of the things that we had practiced and prepared for before allowed us to react to a situation that was unpredictable uh, so we recognized that opportunity and we all committed to it and we shot until the sky got bright in the morning so so this was basically 11 p.m until 4 a.m um and this one had an amazing 63 images that had meteors out of 464 um and that one just it just it, unlike any other experience i've ever had and i want to experience this again um this one is interesting i promise i talked to you about this uh i used low level landscape lighting with an LED panel from the left to describe the yellow mounds here. That's what they're called, these yellow mounds here. Um, and then the sky was from the above sequence. I did a star landscape stacker. So I can show you that. Did I put that on the next slide? There we go. So this is what it would have looked like if I hadn't done any, it put any light on the landscape. And this is just a screenshot from Photoshop. And when I did put light on the landscape, that's what happened and all i did was take my led panel and move way off to the left so that the fall off from the light was very gradual because this is a large area and moved it around four or five times during four or five different frames and masked in the areas that i liked and you can see that in here you can see all the masks that i used there to choose just the areas that i wanted to describe the yellow mounds and it's the difference between this and that and that's what I mean by having a sense of place. If your foreground is dark without any illumination, you're going to disappoint the viewer and perhaps yourself. All right, so let's let's just talk about a, an easy checklist here, right? This is a good time to take a screenshot, although this will be on replay after this forever. Um, you need to know the dates and the times for the meteor shower peak. Right. You need to know what the projected meter count is going to be so that you understand whether this is something that you want to commit to. You need to know how many hours of darkness are going to be. What's the weather going to be? We check the weather constantly. You need to have a backup location just in case. Right. And I'm suggesting that you shoot through the meteor shower, not just the peak night. Shoot before and shoot the night after, possibly the night after the night after. Right. And if possible, you should pack gear for one or two setups. Right. And then you're going to need to consider, are you the kind of person that's going to use uh, a star tracker or not, right? So these are all things to consider. Um, yep. So I know that there's some common questions, and I'm going to read them out and answer them right here. Do you have to face north? This pertains to both the Geminids and the Perseids. No, you don't. You could face in another direction. You won't have a radiant edit you won't be able to see all of the meteors pointing in towards one direction you'll have longer meteors going whoosh, whoosh, across your whole frame and i could show you some some students work from that um and that is glorious because those meteors are long and you can see a lot of color in them i'm just teaching guys how to shoot a gradient here right so it's more about not having to face north but having to face where the radiant is going to be right 
Why shouldn't you move your camera? I think you should understand that by now because you're taking many, many images over the course of possibly hours and they need to stack up on top of each other as you composite them. Do you have to shoot raw? Absolutely. Because you're going to post-process these images. Please don't shoot any final uh, format like a JPEG. Just shoot raw so that you can have the best possibility to pull the most dynamic range out of these images. What do you do with all these files? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and what if Polaris is not in my frame? That's kind of the same question as facing north. Well, if you don't have Polaris in your frame, it might be really hard for you to rotate around true north. Polaris is really close to true north. Uh, that's how we we move all of the frames and pop the stars into place so that the meters all look like they're coming from one place. So I would definitely recommend having Polaris in frame whenever you set up any of these, at least for your first couple of attempts of doing this. Uh, and if that doesn't work out, or if that that's something you decide you want to move away from in the future, that's your choice. All right, so here's the big question. Um, how do I process this? Whew, well, uh, the answer to that is, is pretty long. Um, it requires a pretty deep knowledge of the tools in Photoshop, uh, and it takes a while to explain it. Um, National Parks at Night, we put together uh, an ebook that you can download. Uh, it is a pay what you will. You can pay nothing or you can pay something for it. Uh, if you go to npan.co slash meteors, and I'll post that in the chat, uh, you can download this. And it has a lot of information from planning all the way to editing. But at the end of that, there's editing. And it also links to a blog post that we have that has uh, even more detail. I just want to point out that I don't talk about this here. I'm just getting you ready to shoot it. You can't process it until you shoot it. And the next big one is December 12th, right? So I want you to think about starting to plan for that now for the Geminids of 2021. I know this video is going to last forever, but think about the next meteor shower that you have, right? Um, some of these edits take me eight hours to do. And that's unusual for an edit, but there's just so many images involved and you're really making three images become one in this composite. So uh, most of it is identifying meteors and masking them out and rotating them. That's the bulk of it. The other stuff is fairly simple once you understand masking and blending. Um, but you have to shoot it to edit it. So I'd like you to practice. Now, even if you go out and you shoot something that's not an actual meteor shower, you might want to emulate or simulate this. Um, and I just want to urge you that the thrill, the thrill of not only accomplishing getting the shoot done, but also finishing a meteor shower radiant composite, there's there's not a lot of thrills like it in night photography. Once you get that done, you're like, wow, that was definitely a bucket list shot or a bucket list experience. It's worth it. It is, it is a lot of details to get there, um, but I think that everyone should at least try it sometime. So... That's that. Um, here's just a quick look at, uh, I just made some screenshots for you guys to see. Uh, this is that one that we talked about. This is the foreground image from my PSB. It's like an eight gigabyte file that I have here. So there's the foreground image. Uh, and here is the, the star point stack. And here's all the meteors masked out. So just so you have an idea of roughly what your edit's going to look like, you're going to have those three things where you mask out the landscape and then you place that over the sky and then you add the meteors in and they all add up to something. So now it's time for Q&A. I wish I had a glass of water here, but I'm going to go take a look into the Q&A and I thank you all for your, your, your passion and your confidence in me. If you have more questions, uh, type them in now. Uh, let's, let's talk about, uh, the questions that you have here and keep adding them to the chat. Uh, so Mark asks, have you tried Lightroom's new select sky mask and how does it work with me meteors? If you're talking about the most recent release that just came out last week, no, I have not tried that yet. In fact, I just downloaded that a couple days ago because the internet was so slow in Yosemite. So... We'll get back to you on that. Selecting and masking is a deep, deep topic. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, Adobe keeps improving these things about how to select and mask things. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and Gino said, PhotoPills is $9.99 to plan. Yes, it is. 
I'm totally voting for your your Q and A there. <laughs> so, um, all right, in the chat, let's see. All right, Jeffrey, um, I'm glad you're looking forward to capturing meters in December. I hope this inspires you, uh, Josie. Let's see. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There we go. I'm trying to. We got new stuff coming in here. Uh, Josie, loving the cactus in the foreground, rather lengthy and beautiful desert outburst. Yeah, yeah. The cactus was was a was an interesting choice in that I was straddling like a a, a fin coming out of the earth there, and I had to make my tripod the small version of it with the macro legs, um, and it was rather pointy too. Uh, so that was fun. Uh, I'm just going to go back to the camera here so that you guys can see my face. Um, oh, uh, Adur did say he liked it better without the foreground light. I totally understand. Aesthetics are a very personal thing. And what is natural is really an interesting topic. And we're talking about that a lot uh, when processing and shooting. What what looks right, what looks natural. And I think it's individual to pe to, to different people. And I appreciate your input. Thank you. Um, thank you, Levon, for showing up. Great to see you. Uh, more important questions. All right, let's so. So let me go find some other ones. How do you set the tripod in sand? Okay. So, um, let's make sure I find the ones that Martin flagged for me. Uh, so in this case, when I put the tripod in sand, Martin said that you could use the snow feet and attach them to the legs. That is a great idea. Um, in sand, I also really grab the legs and shimmy it and dig it until it starts to hit something harder. Because if sand can be deep or not deep, but I try and get the legs as firmly placed in sand as you possibly can. Uh, so that helps a lot. Mark asked, is there an app that combines astro and weather? Um, gosh, well, let's see. Not that I've experienced. Um, I prefer Weather Underground, and I've started using Windy. So Weather Underground is my my go to because I can I can create conditions that are perfect for something, and it, I can set up a a custom sort of weather report. And I have one that's called uh, Landscape Photography, which is really astro landscape photography. It tells me the best times for the least amount of clouds and uh, open sky. Um, but I haven't found one yet that combines astro and weather. There's an opportunity for the developers that are watching, right? Ah, uh, so uh, Gino asked, uh, what date and time are the Geminids? Uh, that'd be December 12th at like 2 30 in the morning is when the peak begins, at least at this location when I was showing. And it looked like the same when it was out of Yosemite, so it might be similar longitude. Um, so it really matters where you are. And if you have photo pills, you can find out for your location or for another location you might be considering scouting by setting that in the location. Uh, but the most important thing is we're talking about December 12th in the morning, which means the night of December 11th. So past midnight on December 11th into the morning of December 12th is when the peak of the Geminids is going to be. Um, and Gino also asked, what is a radiant composite? I hope you, I hope I explain that uh, for clarity, but basically I will repeat that at the end here. It's when you photograph a number of images and the starting point for those meteors, let's say in this case, Perseus, all of the meteors look like they're coming from that place. And that's because you've rotated them back to that one moment in time. And wherever the meteor came from should be pointing towards that, unless they were uh, not part of that meteor shower. Uh, and that happens. There's sometimes four meteor showers in the sky at the same time, and they don't belong to that meteor shower, but they're still in the sky at the same time. But I hope that helps. Uh, let's see. I'm looking to see if there's any other things here. I don't see any other new Q&As, but I'm going to look for some other things. Hal, thank you so much for your comments and for being here. Uva, thank you for being here. And Levon, thank you too. And Gino, always a pleasure having you here. Um, so I'm looking again to see if I got Mark's earlier Q&As. Yes, yes, I got both of those. Good. And there's nothing else in there. So... Without further ado, if you guys have any more questions, 
I'd be delighted uh, to answer them. Um, I just want to direct you to understanding what else you can do if you're still interested in stuff. Of course, please check out uh, NovaFlex. They are my my choice when it comes to uh, you know to to what we're talking about here. How to support your important gear, right? So, um, if you'd like to know more about what I do, my personal work is at matthillart.com. You can find me on Instagram at Matt Hill Art. And if it wasn't obvious, I teach night photography workshops and do photo tours with uh, my company called National Parks at Night. Uh, and you can find us on the web at National Parks at Night and on social media at National Parks at Night. We'd love to see you there. Uh, we do have weekly free blog posts. We're very generous with uh, providing education that way uh, and workshops and the Night Photo Summit, which is coming up in February again. So thank you. Oh, Stellarium. Oh, you guys want to know where these other places are. Thank you for that. So let's uh, post some links here. Stellarium, I'm going to post this in the chat, is S-T-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-M, Stellarium. And here is also Photo Pills, a link to Photo Pills, P-H-O-T-O-P-I-L-L-S. And um, the Meteor Shower Guide that I was talking about, here is uh, a direct link to it. Uh, and these things will also be posted in the video description and in the emails that you guys get as follow-ups. Um, and also include some links to the support gear that I use in case you're curious about that. Thank you so much for attending. I appreciate you. Thanks for being here. Uh, and if you have any further questions, um, let me know. I'm seeing if there's any more stuff going on here. Let's see. We've got some other stuff going on. Good. All right. Well, have a great day. Uh, and we will see you. If you have any more questions, hit reply to any of the emails that you got. And those questions will make their way to me. Um, and in the meantime, get out there, get shooting, seize the night. And if you have any examples that you want to share after you shoot the next meteor shower, I would love to see them. Please reach out and let me see them. Thanks. Have a great night. And we'll see you around.